Hello, and thank you so much for joining me for another Enneagram and Marriage podcast episode. I am so grateful to have Hesha Abrams with us today. She's a mediator, an attorney, and an out-of-the-box thinker, which is just what we need on this show when we need fresh ideas for conflict resolution. In particular, Hesha is going to teach us how to hold the calm. It is a most welcome tutorial because she has such a vibrant personality, and I loved the oxygenation we had together during and after this interview to really walk through each of the giftings of each and every personality type, and I think you'll see hers very clearly here. She has such a gift for strength, for direct and simple yet effective communication in the most dire of moments with you and your partner. And she also has a special passion for bringing the peace to these moments through actual resolution. This is her experience when she's had to literally be in charge of helping to negotiate for the PepsiCo secret recipe. She's been involved with so many other huge cases over the world, and she's been honored with many mediation gifts and awards throughout her career. So I am so honored to have her here with us because she truly comes in with a fresh approach. So I'm grateful and I can't wait to let you hear from her. Before we bring her on, I just want to remind you that we have a really special event tonight for those who are listening live, February 12th, Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to have an Enneagram and Marriage chat on how to love every Enneagram type tonight, this week of Valentine's Day. So come join us if you'd like to. The Zoom link is in the show notes, and I cannot wait to see you there. And we will have some Q&A afterwards. Also, don't forget that this Wednesday is Valentine's Day. It's also a quite a doozy because it's also going to be starting off our Lenten season season and it's Ash Wednesday. Um, and then we have our course starting this Thursday for those who are interested in our master class and coaching certification. So it's a really big week here at ENM, and I'm here for it all with you. I'm so grateful you're here for this journey. And I do thank those of you who checked in on me, a few of you boxered me or checked in to say, I hope your anniversary went well, your dating anniversary with your husband. It was 28 years. I'm at that space where I actually had to count. I was like, oh my gosh, it's 28 years. Um, and then he had such a wonderful time visiting our our friends in Arizona with my son and then came home for the the uh the time his friend uh even kindly drove him it was so kind to the airport like middle of the night to get home and it was complete chaos with our daughters hormonal and crying as I was leaving and then crying because we had forgotten to exchange one of their IDs and then Wes had <laughs> uh told me we had enough gas and then we didn't and so there were so many opportunities to lose our crap and to not hold the calm but I am proud to say I remember to keep a positive narrative in the middle of it did my own own e &M work and was like, girl, get off your planning fixation. Everything's okay. And everything was okay. So it was good. And thank you for checking in and everything worked out. There's a much longer version of this story sometime coming your way. If you like, you can always check with me and tell me, but it was so funny. I um, was chatting and leaving all these boxers for my best friend, Stacy, and she and I were cracking up afterwards. And by the time Melody got to this test, she had to take, and she's like, there's technical difficulties. I'm like, oh, Melody, you are taking this test because there's no way that all of this was for naught. Um, but I'm so glad she felt loved and I really believe Wes did too. And I thank you so much for just being part of our fiascos and shenanigans, right? This is what we do for love, right? We have to do all kinds of things because there's so many forces at work to keep people stumbling and struggling. So I am so grateful that everybody worked together and I thank everybody in our community for doing that. And I I want to do the same for you guys. So let's hold the calm together with Hesha and let's bring her on right now. Hesha, I am so happy to have you on the Enneagram and Marriage podcast today. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Ah, oh, we are so in need of holding the calm this year together. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Always though. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, just all about just your dreams for those you get to have read your beautiful book. Uh, I appreciate that. Well, I am a lawyer mm -hmm. uh, and I'm a mediator. And when I, I've been doing this now almost 40 years. Mm -hmm. And when I started, I was very idealistic. We can all talk to each other. We can really be problem solving and we can all listen and we can work out solutions. And I hope you can tell from my mocking tone 
that doesn't work except in, you know, 10% of the time. Yeah. If, if interests are self-aligned and emotional maturity is aligned, you know, you can do that. But what about in like the 80 or 90% of the time when I hate you yeah. or you scare me or you're threatening me or you're trying to make me do something or I'm trying to make you do something. That stuff works. And I am a mediator. I work, I did the case for the secret recipe, the ownership of the secret recipe of Pepsi. Mm -hmm. I've worked for Google and Facebook and, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, NVIDIA and IBM and Verizon. And like, you know, I've done so much stuff that from two roommates whose cat peed on the rug to wrongful death, you know, billion dollar patent cases. Yeah. It's all the same because it's all bumper car ego. Mm. I want what I want. You want what you want. And if we're very polite, you know, we might listen to each other for a little bit while we're arguing in our head. But what I want to tell all of our listeners is the worst tools you can use are logic, reason, rationale, <laughs> facts, or data. And isn't that what we all do? And it does not work. <laughs> I love that you said that. I just said on our deep dive podcast yesterday, I said, I am learning all of the fallacies again with my son. It does not matter for marriage. <laughs> Sounds like it doesn't true. matter in your work either. It's just so true. So the question is, what does work? And I have figured that, look at how do I walk into a case where someone says, I want a hundred million dollars. And the other side says, here's 10,000 drop dead. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to persuade or convince. And when I say to our listeners, how often does splaining something work for you? <laughs> <laughs> I've tried that for so long. Yeah. And isn't that what we do? It doesn't freaking work. So what does work? And so that's why I wrote this simple little, you know, two hour paperback, $15 little inexpensive book, because I wanted everyone to have access to this stuff. You don't need some giant PhD or master's program. Yeah. These are simple things that are like magic beans in your pocket that you can oh. do today to make your life better with lots of different kinds of people. That's what oh. makes this so good. And that what is it? like, like we both agreed before we got on the perfect storm of our work of getting nuanced with me, but then giving everybody the generals for you, because you and I were talking about how not everyone has done these deep dives on personality like we have. And so just to be able to get this is so life giving. So listener, if you're out there and your spouse doesn't have their Enneagram figured out, uh, or maybe you're still on the fence about like, who am I and how do I tick? Hesha's tips today are for all of us, right? Yeah. And they're easily applied. I applaud, first of all, what you're doing is magnificent oh, because it's like that most of us eat, but you're a chef. So you're saying, if you want to go deeper and you want to go better and you want to have mastery, mm. this is fantastic stuff. And a lot of people don't want to do that. They want something quick. They want something right. fast. I can't say I'm in conflict with you. Sure, would you take this Myers-Briggs or <laughs> right. would you do this? I mean, I have to do with you oh, yes. work or yeah. my spouse or my teenage kid right or my boss yeah. now, you yeah. know, and how do I make quick, easy, fast things? And I've got all these oh. amazing oh, tricks that yes. are just easy to do. Yes. And guys, I have her book. It's awesome. So, okay. I have some questions for you today, but this is really up everybody's alley. Um, just you talk about the ears that hear and listening to the ears that hear. That is something that I really resonate with, but I've just started to unpack it a little in my own life. Can you tell us about that? This is a taste of what you guys are going to get in the book here. Sure. So chapter one is speaking to the ears that are hearing you. What we tend to do, like with your Enneagram work, is we tend to do what works for us. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a small sliver and percentage. So let me make it easy for everybody. Mm -hmm. Would you speak to an extrovert the same way you would speak to an introvert? Mm -hmm. Everyone listening goes, of course not. And yet, don't we do that? What about a big picture person who rounds off the numbers versus a detailed analytical person who balances it to the penny? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you talk to them differently? Yeah. How about another one? How about a thinker? Everything is thought, analytical, versus a feeler who's all my intuition and what my gut feels. Wouldn't you talk to that person differently? Mm -hmm. And so it's so simple that when you're talking to somebody, you know, you're listening to them, you know, because remember, we all know good listening, rah, 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 you know. Yeah. But as I'm listening to you, 
I'm also diagnosing. And this is the analogy I want to give everybody. It's a bomb detector. You, that guy is waddles out in his Michelin suit to the town square and there's a bomb. Mm. He didn't just start cutting wires because that's what the last bomb was. He looks, he diagnoses. Is it a pressure switch? Is it chemical? Is it remote control? What is it? So when someone's talking, rather than getting into the argumentative, you're wrong, these are my arguments, use it as a diagnosis. First of all, who the heck am I talking to? Mm. Am I talking to an introvert or an extrovert? Mm. Am I talking to a thinker or a feeler? Mm. Am I talking to a big picture person or a detail person? Mm. Those three questions. Now, you know what that does? That means I listen to you better. Mm. And what the benefit is, is you feel me listening to you better. Because when someone's talking and you're just arguing in your head, they feel it. They know you're not listening to them. But when you're diagnosing, that's the icing on the cake. They feel listened to. You're now saying to myself, okay, how am I going to frame what I'm going to say to you for maximum effect? And that takes five minutes, two mm. minutes. It's not hard to do as you start listening to people. Now, when I give you information, I'm not going to say, here's pizza. Why aren't you eating pizza? You're ridiculous. Everyone likes pizza mm. without finding out that you're gluten intolerant. Mm. You can't eat pizza. Mm. Well, that would have been nice to have found out early. So while you're talking, you could have always listened to content. That part's easy. We can do that. But now I'm listening to who are you? I mean, are you a porcupine? Are you a giraffe? You know, I have a whole thing in the book where I used animals, you know, as to how people are just because it's easier when we get triggered and our amygdala, like if Christina used to start coming at me, yeah, amygdala isn't going to go, oh, I'm so calm. I'm so able to do this. My amygdala goes, whoa, danger, danger, right. pull back. And that's why I created this book and I call it holding the calm because I do that for myself. If yeah. someone's coming at me, yeah. the first thing I say in my head is I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm. And what that says to my nervous system and my amygdala is, girlfriend, mm -hmm. you got choices, mm -hmm. you got options, wow. you've got magic beans in your pocket. We don't have to react. What do we choose to do? And from that place of power, yeah. options open themselves. Mm -hmm. Pain and misery and suffering always comes from feeling powerless. Mm -hmm. So you do anything you can to grab a little bit of power in a healthy way. Yeah. Now I got choices. Anyway, mm. Mm. That's, no, my, that's, I, my, that's my quick two cents. Yeah, no, I love that because I loved that part of your book because we're always trying to do that. But that was going to be my next question was now that we have the insight to listen differently versus just stating our needs and wants. Um, I think that my next question was, how do we bring that calm? Because we know our own nervous system is rising up when we're not doing that. Like when I'm coming at my husband and I'm like, Hey, I need this. I'm feeling unsafe. And that's why I'm coming at him passionately. So mm -hmm. when you remind us of this key phrase, which is also beautifully the title of your book, <laughs> we can remember it. And I love hearing that you use it too. Is this something you developed in your years of practice when it would get overwhelming? I would imagine. Yes. yes because think about it. I get in, I'm in the emergency room medicine of the law. Yeah. You know, I go in and there's like gunshot wounds and stabbings and bombings and the doctor's got to wipe away the blood and figure out what's going on. Yeah. Well, when you're in conflict, whatever is being said is not the real issue. That's just the blood and the stuff on top of it. Yeah. You've got to be able to figure out what's triggering this, mm -hmm. what's really going on. And it's hard to do when you feel attacked yourself. So you need some tools, you need some protections to be able to say, okay, I can take some power back yeah. and choose my response. And literally what I did in the book is there's 20 chapters. Each chapter has one technique with stories and anecdotes and sentence stems. And what I tell people to do is pick two, just pick two and put it in a post-it note by your phone, put it in a note on your phone. So you have it, practice that one. Practice that too. And all of a sudden, it's not hard. It just, mm. it's just part of you to go, okay. And then what happens is you become hungry. Okay, I got those. What's yeah. more? I want yes. another one. I want another oh, one. Yes. And it's, oh. it's exciting to feel some level of power and control yes. in a situation that usually makes us feel, because who wants oh. to feel that? You know? Yes. Like, 
impact? Who likes to be misunderstood? We all go, hey, opportunity for growth. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. And like, I'm always like, take it to God. And it's like, yet right now, what am I going to do here while I'm trying to protect my people or myself or, you know, this justice piece that I feel so deeply about if I can't stand in, if I can't be here. And so you bring us that ability to have that. Of course, we have to leave things to fate to God, but we have so much we can do. And tell us, I love how you brought in uh, the the whole topic of, we talk in marriage sometimes, of course, with John Gottman, the number one marriage researcher out there, uh, with the dream within the conflict. And I know in your book, you also talk about what's behind it. So sometimes when these people come to you with these big cases or couples are having a big fight, um, I notice that you dig a bit too, as you're also learning to feel safe and teaching us that, how can we find out what's really underneath what they are saying and what, what they really deeply do want? Exactly. And you can't ask. That's the hard part because people don't know. They don't know. I'm mad about this. <laughs> Not really what you're mad about. That's just the topping that is exploding, but it's really underneath. And the way you find out is by staying calm, by holding the calm, by using some of these techniques of listening. And then really very quickly, five or 10 minutes, all of a sudden things diffuse. And then the person can think, mm. well, what I was really upset about was we had a fight last week that didn't really get resolved. And now it's now. Mm. Oh, so it's very interesting, right? Wow. So I just thought of something crazy that I don't normally talk about on podcasts, but it happened with my husband and I yesterday. So may I share oh, something yeah, personal? Please, and that. it's going to well, make everybody laugh. Yes. <laughs> just laugh. So, you know, there's a joke about toilet paper. Does it roll o over or does it roll under, right? <laughs> and so I like it rolling under and my husband likes it rolling over. And I normally just ignore it and it's always over. And I just decided to play with him a little bit. So every time in our bathroom, I would flip the toilet paper around and then <laughs> I would notice it was flipped around. So we just kept doing this and I'm laughing and I'm thinking this is a game. Yeah. And I wonder how long before he's going to say something, you know, because I'm, I'm just being playful about it. Right. And it went two weeks. Yeah. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything because I wanted to see what he would actually do. And all the women listening to us, you guys are all cracking up now, right? So we had to talk about it last night. And all of a sudden in bed, he says, can I ask you a question? Yes. Why do you keep flipping the toilet paper? So we're just laughing and, I'm, and we're joking about it. And I'm telling him, to me, yeah. it's so much easier to pick it up from the bottom. Like it's just easier. <laughs> but then you know what he said to me that I didn't think of, even me with all my experience, blah, blah, men stand to pee. So it's easier to take the toilet paper from the top women stick to pee. So it's easier for us to take it from the bottom. Something as simple as that, that it didn't dawn on me because I don't stand to pee. So it just didn't even dawn on me. Look at the learning and the understanding that happened by just staying calm and by listening. And I guarantee you, unless the other person is insane, right. they have a perspective, they yeah. have a point of view. Yes. And if you figure out why they think what they think, nine times out of 10, it's just interesting. Mm. Like, why do you think that way? I never yeah. thought of it that way, or I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have connected the dots that way. Yeah. But think of the opening that that creates and the beauty and richness in all your relationships, not just marriages, yeah. teenagers, kids, yes. coworkers, bosses. Mm -hmm. This just makes everything richer mm -hmm. and more authentic. And what will happen is people won't say, oh, you're holding the calm. They'll say, you just get along with everyone, don't you? Oh. Or you just seem to solve problems or yeah. you're so easy to deal with. Yeah. That's what people say. Yeah. Which is such a beautiful gift to be able to share in the world when there's always a great need for peace and camaraderie. And we know that lately we've been seeing in medical news that in addition to health and fitness, social cues are so important for health and how bad loneliness got over COVID. So you're helping us to be able to sit with people, not just to kind of ward ourselves off. Um, and this also was so fascinating about your book when you talked about reciprocity bias. And that was so encouraging to me. Can you tell our listeners about what that is? 
and uh, what we can do with that. It's just so marvelous. So neuroscientists have actually identified 147 cognitive biases that are across all genders, all ethnicities, all socioeconomic. It just seems to be a human being thing about how we interact with each other, which is so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, I try to go by the 80-20 rule. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to be 100%, right? But if it's 80% good, this is great. I can work with this because yeah. there's always going to be outliers and people that are outside. So don't worry about the exceptions. Worry about the 80 to 90% that this act stuff actually works with. So if I invite you to my house for dinner, mm -hmm. you're likely to bring a bottle of wine or some flowers. Mm -hmm. Why? And you'd say, well, it's just good manners. No, it's not. It's the reciprocity bias. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be in my debt. Right. So if I, you come to my house for a dinner party, you're technically in my debt. So you yeah. bring flowers or, or cake or you make something. Well, yeah. now we're even. Even though it's not really even even, yeah. it's even enough because we yeah. don't like to be in each other's debt. We don't enjoy that. Right. And so there's this reciprocity thing and it works even with, if I listen to you 80% of the time, you're gonna have to listen to me or you're gonna feel like a doof. You're right. gonna feel like a jerk. And right. so- who does it first? The one who's more emotionally mature or the one who's less triggered. That's always been my rule, like in my marriage with my husband. Mm -hmm. The one we say that to each other, the one who's less triggered is the one who has to be the more mature one. Oh, I love that. Yes. Okay. And it has maybe less trauma um, because that's hard to unpack. Yes, you do marry somebody technically who usually has about the same level of mental health as you, but sometimes things happen and things get uncovered. And, and so I love that you're reminding everybody, don't feel bad if you're the person who has to lead here to be mature. That's beautiful. That's a gift you can bring to the world, to your partner. Oh right. my gosh. I love and, that. And, you'll find, and it flips back and forth too. You'll find that let's say you usually have to do it. Okay. That's fine. That's your personality, but you're just filling the gas tank for when you need it. Yeah. You know, that's like the beauty of how this thing works. So oh, yeah, and it just makes life happier and better because you're not keeping keeping score is the number one way to misery and unhappiness. Yeah. Yes. And I so, have noticed that. Yes, because some couples do that where they're like, I do this, this percentage and percentages don't work because we're more complex than that, right? Correct. And they're not always accurate. And it comes yeah. from just think of the toilet paper. The yeah. other guy has a perspective. Now, yeah. you know, he's not vacuuming like he should or he should be doing this or whatever. You yeah. know, I, again, I don't know if I should be risque on our on our program, but I'm going to be honest if that's okay. Yes, please. Just imagine, just imagine you don't want you want your husband to do the dishes or you want him to vacuum and he doesn't do anything. You do all of it yourself. You can go, you don't do it. And I do everything around here. Nah, 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 nah. That's going to get you crap. And we all know it. That's not going to work. Right. If, if you somehow get him to do dishes one time and then go up and hug him and kiss him and say, do you know how sexy you are when you're doing dishes? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, you are so <laughs> sexy and so handsome. Just watching you helping me with those dishes. He's going to do the damn dishes. <laughs> It's not our stuff. <laughs> it's using the right approach. Right. You found the love language and you went for it, girl. And I love that. And that is so beautiful and really helps us to remember, like, even if we're like, I'm up here on my justice point and I hate the statistic about women doing more dishes than men. And then you're like, but how to bring change. That's your job. That's where you come in all the time to mediate is as much as you might have these high ideals and platitudes, what's really going to work? And that's, that's, that's what all I care about. Do. What is going... Uh, I remember years ago, I mediated a case for a manufacturer of Sears mm. and, he, and I was young and we were trying to do something. We were complaining about the manufacturing process wasn't perfect. And he looked at me and he said, best is the enemy of better. Mm. And I remember going, that's just stupid. And I was irritated and I was annoyed. And I have spent 20 years thinking about that. Yeah. Hot darn, was he right? Oh, Hot yes. darn, was he right? You know, you want better and best is the enemy of better. And I have a whole chapter in the book I call creating small winnable victories. Mm. You don't do things in big stuff. Mm -hmm. You erode the disagreements and the barriers from the outside. And mm. then it erodes and then a solution happens. And then you go for good. 
Mm. Then you go for better. Then you go for better. And because if you try to go for best, look what's happened in our society now. Culturally, we are ripping each other apart because each side wants the best of what they want. Mm. And it's just ripping us apart. Mm. So oh, wow. Well, incremental improvements, and then life actually improves. I'm I'm interested in life yeah. actually improves. I'm interested in actually settling the case, actually getting something done, not nice airy fairy concepts about what should work. I want what really does work. <laughs> this is so refreshing to hear. And of course, I know I fall into both. Sometimes I'm passionate with you and I'm baby stepping and doing it. And then sometimes I'm like lamenting and in my ideal. So it is so beautiful to get these action steps. Um, tell us what we can do when we are feeling like the other person is yelling. I love how you are not afraid to go there. Of course, you've already shared it a bit here, but uh, just in marriage and life, when our partner is you know, over the top and we're like, I'm out of here, I'm gonna go into my withdrawing, what can we do instead? Because we know it never resolves anything, but yet um, you know, we feel in that moment like that person is attacking and that's scary. Exactly right. So there's two things. One, it depends on what the skill set is. If you have had the ability in couples counseling, or let's say this book or Love Languages book or your stuff, it, it doesn't really matter. You need a lexicon of something that you both say, we're going to agree that when times are tough, these are the techniques we're going to use or the lexicon we're going to use or how we're going to do it. Yeah. Now you can then remind that person, like, for example, if you're using holding the calm, just to say, I'm feeling really tense right now. So I'm just going to hold the calm for a moment. And um, can you breathe with me? Mm. Can we just breathe with each other for a minute? Mm. Think what that does. Mm. Oh, for God's sakes, it calms the sympathetic nervous system down. I'm sorry, I got really heated there. I really apologize. I know we want to talk about it. It's a fantastic technique mm. when there's some emotional maturity and a common lexicon that works mm. great. And it, I do it in my, in my own marriage. My husband and I do that all the time, you know, mm. like breathe with me mm. because life is filled with junk and you've got yeah. you know, bumper car egos and bad things happen and let's talk real life stuff happens. Right. Mm -hmm. So it is a fantastic technique to use, mm -hmm. but I want to do the advanced class for everybody. Mm. Let's say you're with somebody that won't do it or can't do it mm. or is freaking out. Mm. So natural re re reaction is to, you know, fight or flight, right? Mm -hmm. Or freeze one of the others. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you take some kind of power in a situation and you can actually say, look, I'm feeling really triggered right now. I am going to hold the calm. I need five minutes to take a walk. And then we can try to talk about this, but I can't do it with this much tension in the room. Mm -hmm. And then you leave or you walk into the bathroom. Go. I tell people bathroom breaks are the greatest thing in the world. I have to pee. Okay, that's totally fine. Um, but what you're really doing is you're taking back power to say, we're not going to play it that way. That way is not effective and it's not good. Yeah. But I'm not going to blame you and attack you for doing it because I joke that never in the history of calming down yeah. has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down. <laughs> right? Never. <laughs> and it must be. You know, and here's the neuroscience behind that. Because you say, oh, it's funny, but why? Because if I'm so triggered that I cannot calm down, mm -hmm. my amygdala is going powerless, 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 freak out. And I'm just freaking out with whatever tools are at my disposal. Mm -hmm. When you say to somebody, calm down, what you're saying is, whoa, mm -hmm. you are out of control. I am in control. Mm -hmm. You have no power. I have the power and I'm going to tell you what to do. All it does is make the amygdala freak out even more. Mm -hmm. So being able to just withdraw and say, I am, and that's why, you know, what I call the book, it's a verb. It's not, you know, just hold the calm or breathe deeply. It's holding the calm because it's, this is a book for carnivores. This is not a touchy feely kumbaya book. This is real life. Yes. What do you do in difficult situations? And uh, and I'll give you one more third one that I like to talk about in the book in general, but it might work in this situation too. Yeah. Uh, let's say you're at a meeting mm -hmm. and a coworker is, you know, you know, expounding thusly, or let's say you're at Thanksgiving dinner and your crazy uncle is just poking everyone with political mm -hmm. nonsense or, you know, trying to get a rise out of it. Or let's say your partner, your spouse, mm -hmm. or your teenager is saying stuff just to give you that needle. You know when that's happening. Mm -hmm. 
I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm, I'm holding the calm to yourself. And then this is what you say. You know what I admire about you? Guess what? They stop talking. Mm. Nobody says a word after that. And I tell people, choose your verb. What I admire about you, what I respect about you, what I like about you, what I love about you. Mm. Choose your verb, whatever verb's going to work for you. That person stops in their tracks. Mm. Then you say something true. Your passion, your curiosity, your commitment, your determination. See how easy all that is? The other person literally goes, I, I don't know what just happened. I, 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 I'm not just sure what happened. And in that encounter, who's yeah. got the power? That's the key. Who's got the power? And now there's a there's a it's a control all delete it's a reset it's what just happened it works with everyone in every situation and it works better and better the better and better you get at it so uh -huh. you i have those four verbs i use but it's magnificent i mean literally what will happen is around the table the people that were not triggered will snicker and they'll just go you're good <laughs> you're good, <laughs> you're good. I love that. It's great. <laughs> it's beautiful, Hashna. And it is truly good. I mean that. Like, that's virtuous that you are not just identifying a way to bring that calm, but you're also allowing that person to save face in the moment. Um, and I've talked about a, a teacher who did that for me years back when I was jealous in class, and she found a way to reframe something to be more about the Red Sea in Sunday school than about my anger and jealousy. And I was like, yes, that's the Red Sea. And so she found that trigger point to say, let me feed that little girl's ego who is too amped up right now. And so when our partners are in this space, we can allow ourselves to speak to them with life-giving words, even when they're feeling that. But like you also said, you also can gain that healthy power back by heading out of the room, taking a break. That is very healthy and it allows our heart rate to settle down. These are beautiful tips. Um, it's making me wonder um, one more tip if you have time for it that you mentioned in the book I wanted to ask about. Mm -hmm. sure. um, okay. So you talked about how uh, food can also be a great reducer of stress together and uh, building teamship. Tell us about this. I'm a foodie. I'd love to hear this. I know many in our audience are as well. Isn't it interesting? Again, it's one of the cognitive biases that we're cave people and we have to eat, right? Mm -hmm. And so about when you eat with each other, it's very hard to stab each other, mm -hmm. right? Now you've been family dinners and people are eating together and they're nasty. So then you use that sentence stem technique I just gave us a minute ago. Mm -hmm. But let's say that we're together and there's something that's tense. It's like, you know what? I'm hungry. I could use something sweet. I could use a carb you know, let's get some comfort food and continue this conversation. Think what that does to the other person, right? And then think about this under the bias of reciprocity. Let's say you're arguing with um, a man, yeah. just to use a stereotype. And men generally want to be their woman's hero, right? right? Well, you've just been haranguing him about what a failure he is and he's not doing this right and he's not doing that right. All of a sudden, he can take care of you mm -hmm. by feeding you. So now his ego is not quite as bruised. Now it can stand back up again. He doesn't have to protect it as much. Maybe he'll listen better. Yeah. And I say the same thing for guys listening when you're talking to women. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, sexuality is on a spectrum and da, 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 da. So I'm giving just the generalized rules. Everybody's a little masculine, a little feminine. Adapt this to yeah. your partner however you want. But it's those ideas of how do I change the music? Because this music is not working. Mm -hmm. This is not helpful for us. Yeah. Yes. And then again, who's got the power? Right. Well, you can do that. And that's why <laughs> you and your partner can each read it and talk with, them, with each other. And one of the things I did in the back of the book is, you know, the uh, publishers initially wanted me to charge for a workbook and a fancy thing. And I said, I'm not doing that. So I yeah. give it away for free in the back of the book. Mm -hmm. It's a discussion guide that tracks the book question by question. And so what I tell people is, 
it's like, you know, baby marriage counseling that you can work on together. Mm -hmm. It's workplace training. It's within your church or your synagogue or your mosque or your organization. Because if you get a group of people together, what's so interesting is, you know, you, you rotate facilitation of who's going to do it. And the first person reads the question and somebody says, well, that's just stupid. I thought that story was ridiculous and it didn't mean anything to me. And mm -hmm. someone else says, I found it very inspiring. Mm -hmm. You did? Mm -hmm. Why? Oh, now it's the toilet paper up and down because we all say, oh, we should react with curiosity, yeah. but we don't because we're labeling humans who put things in categories and boxes. So you have to kind of push a little to get to the curiosity. And then the person goes, oh, 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 I didn't realize that. And if we'll notice in my book, I have a lot of stories that appeal to sort of the liberal kumbaya crowd. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of stories that appeal to the carnivorous take no prisoners crowd. Mm -hmm. And when I was working with my publishers, mm -hmm. there were several people on both sides of the spectrum, went, oh, I hate that story. We should take it out. And I go, no, that's why we keep it in. Because yeah. it doesn't appeal to you, but it will appeal to them. I mean, I want this to be a real live book that works for real live people in real live situations that isn't about, you know, they, they just hold hands and run in the meadow because <laughs> that's not the way it is. <laughs> I'm going to run in the meadow and stab you. <laughs> right. Right. You're like, I am out there, guys. It is a jungle out there officially. <laughs> she has officially told us. <laughs> and so we have to work with this. <laughs> right. Yes, it's like having, I remember years ago, someone telling me you want to have your mind open, but not so open that your brains fall out. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so true. And I feel like what you're also saying, and of course, this is my bit of kumbaya I'm bringing to this, but I, I have both. So I get both sides. And um, I think most of us probably do that. Um, we want that. But when we are trying to take power, I feel like when we share power, that's true intimacy. Is that what you find in marriage? And when you finally do get to that answer? Yes. Yes. You know, and here, this is something that I get, I use it in my own marriage. Uh, years ago, I read about ice dancers uh, mm -hmm. in the Olympics mm -hmm. and, you know, they do this or, and the pairs ice skating. Yeah. I mean, think of the amount of work that they go into to get to the Olympics and you get there and one partner turned their ankle a 16th of a degree and it didn't land right and you lost or one of them didn't hold you the right way and you fell. Mm -hmm. Think of the blame and recrimination that could happen would be extraordinary, right? Mm -hmm. And they did a study and they found out that the teams that survived were the teams that said, we fell. Mm -hmm. Never you fell, wow. it's never I fell, it's never I didn't catch you or you didn't catch you, it's we fell, how could we have done that better? And I adopt that in my own marriage. And it helps me because there's times where I love my husband dearly and he'll do something idiotic. Yeah. And I want to go, what are you doing? And then I think, okay, how did I not see that coming? Yeah. How did not I not help prevent that? Yeah. We fell. And he does it with me. So mm -hmm. we do it together. It's been a it's it, it's 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 hard to do. Of course it's hard to do, but we're easy, everyone would do it. Yeah. But you know, you need a common lexicon. Again, that's why I wrote this kind of a book. So it's, you know, you've got your engrams, if you can get everyone to do that. You've got the Myers-Briggs things. You've got the love languages. You've got holding the calm. There's so many different vehicles. Just pick a vehicle. It doesn't really matter. And make that be your common lexicon. And then if you do that, then you're going to want to go deeper. Like your work is so deep. You're going to want to go deeper because now it's interesting and it's curious. And now I want to know, what makes you tick more or how to please you or how to avoid upsetting you? Wow. Think about how beautiful that is in spouses, in families, in parent child. Mm. Think about teenagers. Oh my gosh, I mean, think yeah. about, you know, uh, uh, colleagues at work. Yeah. I mean, this applies to human being bumper car ego interactions. And it just, I just have to tell you, it's like, mm. It's like having uh, uh, magic beans in your pocket, <laughs> really. 
Yeah, it really is. And I mean, you did say so many lexicons we can pick from, but guys, this book is incredible. And so are you. And I am so glad I am not an instinct type. Obviously I'm a thinking type, but I went with instinct to have her on. And I am so honored that you came onto our show because I was like, she's not in our wheelhouse, but you are in our wheelhouse, girl. So <laughs> thank you so much. Everyone needs this book. Tell us where we can get it, where we can find your work. It is so awesome. Thank you. I'm, you know, like I'm not trying to, you know, develop a training program or a teaching program. I mean, I'm a busy full-time mediator. Yeah. I just want more people to have this information. Oh. So um, I've got holdingthecalm.com is my website. Every podcast I'm on, I've been on about a hundred of them is on there on all range of topics. I've got free articles, mailing lists, all that junk, just so people can get more information. But I post on LinkedIn and on Instagram, I mean, excuse me, on LinkedIn and Facebook, and we're starting an Instagram thing. I post every day. And I post in one of three categories, inspirational, educational, uh, or entertainment. Mm. And so each thing is designed to be two sentences, three sentences, like one of the things I posted the other day is, did you know that the continents move at the same rate that fingernails grow? Oh, oh my gosh. How interesting. How interesting, right? <laughs> so I have interesting things. I have poignant things. I have inspirational things. And I'm just trying to do it to keep the conversation up. So we're not just always talking about all the bad junk that yeah. is going on and keep ourselves up so we can actually, you know, improve things. And yes. be one of the improvers as opposed to the destroyers. Oh my gosh. Well, you are a lawyer, but you absolutely have the psychologist gift. So thank you for thank sharing. You. Thank you. Oh, I have to tell people, of course, it's on Amazon and Target, yeah. Barnes and Noble and, yeah. you know, all the places. And uh, so connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, if you get the book and feel like leaving a review, that is always a helpful yes. you know, thing for the, for the algorithm. And I'd like to hear from people if you try stuff your stories, you know, shoot me an email. Um, I, I, I like to hear about it. Oh, awesome. We'll do so. Thank you. We will put all of that in the show notes. Hesha, thank you so much. My pleasure. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for joining us for that episode. I told you Hesha had so many great tips. I love her index. I love that she brought that up too, that she has so many other features to just get you continuing to ask the questions. And if you're just stuck and struggling, like, ah, oh, I'm using my Enneagram work and I'm doing everything. Don't forget to check out tonight where we're meeting. Don't forget to check out Hesha's book. Don't forget to check out our master class. We have so much for you so that you don't despair, so that you keep having empathy, community, and resources. We are here for it all with you. Have a wonderful day. Happy Valentine's Day. I will have an episode for you Wednesday as well. Bye-bye.